Welcome. Thank you for joining today's webinar on libraries and workforce development. I'm Amanda Berks and Shulkoff with National Skills Coalition. We have a packed agenda, so I'm going to go ahead and get started here with some introductions as folks filter in. We had more than a thousand folks register for today's webinar, so that's really indicative of some terrific interest in the field. We thank you for your interest. We thank you to all of you who submitted questions in advance. And we will be following up after the webinar, not only with slides and recording from today's webinar, but with um, a few additional follow-up answers to questions we may not be able to get to in today's conversation. So I'm gonna ask um, that we go to the next slide here. I'm joined by some fabulous partners, um, including my colleague, Jessica Cardat, our Senior National Network Manager here at National Skills Coalition, uh, Lara Clark of the American Library Association and the Public Library Association, and Liana Volpe and Stephanie Holcomb of the Heldridge Center at Rutgers University. They'll be turning off their cameras now, but you'll see them later in the webinar. Um, we have a, a, a very full agenda, as I said, um, but I would like to tell you a little bit about National Skills Coalition. We are a 20-year-old nonprofit organization. We are focused on making sure that people have access to high-quality, inclusive skills training, particularly for jobs that require more than a high school diploma, but not a four-year degree and making sure that more people have access to a better life um, and make sure that businesses have access to the skilled workforce they need. We do our work through four networks. That includes our 20 state skill span coalitions, a national network of tens of thousands of workforce boards, community colleges, community-based nonprofits, labor unions, chambers of commerce, and other partners. Our Business Leaders United affiliate, which focuses on small and mid-sized businesses, and then 40,000 grassroots folks in our Voices for Skills network who speak up to policymakers about the need for skills training in their communities. So that's a little bit about National Skills Coalition. In the interest of time, we're going to move along here to the next slide. So the pandemic really sparked an aha moment. And uh, my guess is that a lot of you uh, who are in particularly in public library roles, you dealt with that aha moment, uh, you know, firsthand, right? You had a lot of policymakers in your community who suddenly realized both that everything their constituents wanted to do required digital literacy and that libraries were absolutely critical in helping them build those digital skills. And libraries have been leaders in digital inclusion for a long time. I started my career in the late 90s teaching in a small public library outside Philadelphia, uh, basic internet um, uh, 101 classes. We did email FTP and this new thing called the World Wide Web, which some of you may have heard of. And when the pandemic hit, I know that many of you shifted seamlessly to providing services virtually and otherwise um, in a really challenging environment. Next slide. But the challenge now is really to meet the moment over the medium term. There are millions of unemployed workers in the US as well as workers whose jobs have changed under their phonetic. What it looks like to be a phlebotomist who needs to use electronic health records or a construction worker who needs to use a mobile app to com communicate blueprint changes to the general contractor, that has changed over the past year. Employers have fast forwarded 10 years of technological change in the last 10 months. So libraries are a vital partner in helping patrons to reskill, upskill, or just stay adapted to the way their jobs are kind of changing under their feet. Even in an environment where we know that libraries themselves have been stretched and asked to grow in new ways and to do professional development on the fly and virtually. Next slide. So our first question to you all is whether your library provides any workforce development services to patrons. And just as a clarification, some folks call these career services or employment services. At the low end, they could be, for example, um, uh, resume classes or interviewing viewing sessions. They could be a job that you, they could be an online class in GED or high school equivalency or job training. Uh, they could be any kind of a range of different workforce related activities. So we'll give folks just another minute to fill out the poll here. 
you should be able to see poll results popping up in the chat. I do see that a lot of folks have been introducing themselves in the chat. So thank you. Again, we have more than a thousand of you from across the country today, um, as well as some folks from outside the United States. I'm thrilled to see that folks from my home community of the Free Library of Philadelphia are here. Um, and thanks so much to all of you for joining us. We're gonna close out the poll now and then go ahead and share some results in the chat for you. Okay, so we see that 43% of you say that you have provided, you are providing workforce development services directly to your patrons. 19% of you are hosting another provider at your location. 21% are providing them in some other way. 12% are not providing, 2% don't know, and for 3% it's not applicable. Perhaps you are at a state library or in another role uh, related to library and workforce policy. So you hear this message loud and clear, right? You know this need is, is urgent. You've already been doing it. My goal today is to help make sure that you have resources to understand how else your library can bulk out what it's doing and who the partners are that you might want to connect to. Next slide. Um, federal policies are vital, right? You know about IMLS, you know the Institute of Museum and Library Services and how there are discretionary grants that your state library association, your individual library can apply for. Today, I'm gonna to walk you through a handful of other federal policies that can also be a source of funding, either directly to a library or indirectly if you subcontract through a partner. Next slide. So we have one more poll that we'd like to do, and that's just a quick gauge of your level of familiarity, Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act. So if you could take a moment now to fill out that poll, that would be terrific, just to make sure that folks have a sense of kind of where we are um, in the landscape. WIOA has been around since 2014, but that was actually just the latest reauthorization of a piece of workforce legislation that's actually been around for almost 60 years. And Congress reauthorizes it about every 10 years and provides an, usually a new name and sometimes some new focus areas for this workforce legislation. We'll just give folks one more minute to fill out a poll here and then we'll share results. I see that we have folks joining us again, not only from us, but folks from Singapore and the Philippines, which is super exciting. We appreciate your flexibility with the time zone differences across the globe. And we are very grateful that you've made time in your day or your evening or your morning to join us here. Let's share our poll results now. Okay. So for a lot of you, the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act is brand new. You are learning about it today. And I want to be clear, we're not going to attempt to try to make you policy experts in the next uh, 53 minutes. Um, first of all, it wouldn't be fun for you. And second of all, um, it wouldn't allow us to get to a lot of the other things we want to make sure to cover today. What we want to do are two things. We want to whet your appetite so that you can learn a little bit about key legislation. And two, we want to point you to where you can dig deeper if you want to. And I know you're all librarians, and I have had in my career the experience of having worked in reference, in circulation, in cataloging, and in children's services. So I know librarians love nothing more than a place where they can dig deeper and follow up. And rest assured, we'll be giving that to you. Next slide. So the Workforce Innovation Opportunity Act provides about $2.5 billion of funding nationally each year through state and local workforce boards. And those workforce boards run what are called one-stop centers or American job centers. Some states have their own framing for the funding of those um, or their brand names sort of. Sometimes those are co-located at library branches, uh, but most often they are not. And those centers are expected to help folks with um, uh, folks who've been dislocated, that is laid off from a job, um, or become unemployed through other means, folks who are just trying to connect the labor market for the first time. And they have a really titanic task. Two and a half billion dollars might sound like a lot of money, but when you spread it across 550 state and local workforce boards across the country, it's actually pretty light 
funding, um, and it's decreased in real terms over the past 15 years. The second piece of the Workforce Innovation Opportunity Act is a little over a half a billion dollars in Title II, which funds GED or high school equivalency classes, adult English language classes, and um, adult basic education or pre-GED classes. This is probably the piece that most of you would have any connection to because libraries for more than 100 years have been a place where folks can access English language learning and other adult education opportunities. So that's powerful, but it's one step in the workforce development process. One of our goals today is to make sure that you're thinking about the workforce partners in your community, whether it's a workforce board, a one-stop career center, or other training provider that you might be able to connect your patrons to through what I call a warm handshake referral rather than a kind of cold business card referral. We wanted to briefly touch on some other examples of public policies that can provide funding indirectly to libraries. So in the next slide, you'll see that we're gonna emphasize American apprenticeship grants. This has been an area of bipartisan agreement in Congress. And you might think this seems pretty far afield from libraries because most folks think apprenticeship and they think building trades. But actually apprenticeship has changed dramatically in the last seven to eight years. We've seen a growth in apprenticeships that help people become broadband technicians, that help people become culinary arts specialists, specialists at Hilton hotels, that help people become healthcare workers. So one thing to think about is, is the adult education program at your library, whether it's an English class or a high school diploma class, are they connecting to an apprenticeship track in your community? Could you be a pre-apprenticeship site, right? Um, and again, there's lots of opportunity to delve deeper into each of the examples I'm sharing, but we just wanted to whet your appetite. The next slide, I just wanted to highlight another policy called SNAP Employment and Training which is the food stamps uh, employment and training piece. This is a program that's typically run through your state uh, human services agency, and can, they can be a terrific partner, again, in subcontracting with training providers, which can certainly include libraries. So that's something to check both at your state level and also at the county level, because some states run this through their county. Uh, we also have community development block grants. Those are given to urban areas around the country. Uh, I think typically cities of 100,000 or more. That money is not specifically designated to libraries, but can be used for libraries in low income communities who are providing workforce services under certain circumstances. So particularly for those of you who are serving a lot of low income patrons, this can be an important source. Uh, next slide. And then the last piece is the American Rescue Plan. This is the $1.9 trillion piece of legislation that Congress just passed. We'll talk more about this later, so I want to go ahead and move us along. In the next slide, you should um, see, well, you'll see some data in just a moment, but I wanted to emphasize libraries bring expertise, right? You bring expertise in technology services, expertise in connecting with communities, and trust. People trust their local library. And that's often something that your workforce partners don't necessarily have, right? They may be waiting for folks to come knock on their doors who are job seekers, but you already have those outstanding connections in the community. So when you're thinking about what would get a workforce partner to listen to me and to want to subcontract with me, that's one of the things you bring to the table. Next slide. And in particular, you can share some, some data on digital literacy. I'm going to zoom through these slides here, but a third of workers in the United States lack digital skills. These are from a longer report that we've issued, and I'll drop the link to that in the chat in just a moment. Um, it is not just an issue for younger workers, for older workers, rather. Younger workers also have digital skill gaps. You can see in the green bars here the workers under the age of 35. Many of these workers are working in jobs, as you'll see in the next slide, that include, um, uh, that require them rather to use moderate or complex levels of computer skills. So they're spending a huge amount of time trying to cover for and compensate for their digital skill gaps. And then finally, as you'll see in the, in the last data slide, um, we see that workers of color face disproportionate skill gaps 
because of structural racism factors. We know that libraries are a trusted partner, next slide, and libraries can help close those gaps. We know also that many of your patrons trust their local library as an opportunity for reskilling or upskilling. So that's the end of my opening portion of the presentation. I wanna go ahead and turn it over now to my colleagues, uh, Stephanie and Liana from Heldrich Center at Rutgers. They're gonna share information from a recent study they've done around public libraries and what they're calling strategically virtual services. Stephanie and Liana. Thanks so much, Amanda. And thank you guys for having us here. We're really excited to be presenting some of our recent work around libraries. Um, I'll get started. On the next slide, my name is Stephanie Holcomb. I'm a research project coordinator at the Heldrick Center at Rutgers University. I'm joined by my colleague, Liana Volpe, who's also a research project coordinator at the Heldrick Center. So I'm gonna quickly walk us through some of the research that we did a few years ago. Um, this was started in New Jersey, did an expansive um, national scan with a lot of support from our state library and the Libs Works group. Um, so we were really just interested in documenting the landscape of career services at libraries um, and really hoping to provide some research support that librarians could use to communicate their services that they were able to provide. Um, and also to highlight some of the challenges and need for additional resources. So first we started with a literature review. We did website scans, scans of annual reports and program materials. The main component of it was a survey that was sent out to all state library staff. Um, so we targeted kind of the top three people at each state library for an electronic survey. Um, we had a response rate of 37% for that. So that was a coverage of 35 states. And then Noting that you know the state library staff couldn't necessarily speak to everything that was happening at the individual level. We then did interviews with um, 22 local library staff and that gave us coverage of 21 additional states. Um, so in the research that we did, we saw a wide range of different services that libraries were able to offer around career services. Um, and some of this was new information to us, some of it you know, I didn't think was typically known. And this ranged from um, kind of one-off supports, like someone comes in, needs help with their resume, or just needs help with a job application, um, to more strategic embedded programming, like literacy programs, um, you know, job search classes, those types of supports that are more embedded in the programming. Next slide. One of the things we asked was about their current and projected demand for career services. And this was kind of surprising to us back in 2018 when you know the economic landscape was a lot different than <clears throat> it is now. We're currently facing a crisis and a hopeful recovery soon. But um, it, even back in 2018, we saw that the demand, people were saying the demand was either medium or high in most um, states. And then in the projected demand, on the next slide, they were saying, you know, even in 2018, they projected about a 90% said there would be an increase in demand for career services. And again, this was interesting to us at the time because we thought, you know, unemployment was pretty low. A lot of people were looking for work. Um, so we thought it would have been a little bit lower at the time. But we, what we heard from people was that people were facing kind of harder to serve situations, looking to upskill or reskill. Um, looking for different technology resources. So the dynamic was just changing and it was a little bit harder to provide career services kind of on a more one-on-one -on -one individualized basis. And of course we asked about the challenges. So when asking what type of additional resources would better support the library career services in their state, um, more funding is always kind of the most common thing. So 92% said that would help. The next bucket was staff training and additional staff. So um, whether their staff had the expertise to provide specific career services that people were coming in asking for, or staff just didn't have the time with all of their other priorities. So they might have needed additional staff or staff dedicated to those services. Um, the other two were assistance with data collection and with program development. And then thinking about the strengths, um, you know, throughout all of our research, we've seen that libraries offer, like I said, a lot of different career services that are really important to the communities they serve. Um, 
And it's a different environment that they're offering these career services in than kind of most workforce development centers or programs. Um, and I think this is for two main reasons. One is that, like Amanda said, they're really embedded and trusted in their communities. They are located um, more prevalently than most other providers. Um, and people know them, they're a trusted resource. People come in for other reasons besides career services. So they might be more likely to just know that that's something that's available to them in the community. And also they have expertise that's different um, than a lot of other providers in that they're used to these one-on-one -on -one, um, service provision situations. They're experts in research and libraries provide the types of resources that are needed for job search like digital literacy and access to technology. So I'm gonna turn it over to Liana who's gonna talk about some of our more recent research. All right, thank you, Stephanie. So building off of everything that Stephanie has presented, in summer 2020, we wanted to understand how library services had pivoted during the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, we very much recognize that libraries are essential in community life and in service delivery. So we pivoted our attention to understanding more deeply how libraries pivoted to virtual services um, with a particular emphasis on these services available to the unemployed, as well as the services that were specifically dealing with their job search needs, as well as their social and emotional support needs. Um, so in this review, um, which is specific to New Jersey public libraries, over the course of four months, we examined 293 public library websites and conducted three roundtable sessions, which gave us coverage of about 50 librarians and library staff. Next slide, please. Uh, so the state of virtual library service in New Jersey, the findings from this work really painted a picture of an expansive uh, library network and hardworking librarians and library staff all trying to uh, adapt to a changing environment. Uh, a lot of progress had been made in, in terms of adapt adaptations, um, but at the same time, there is still room for growth in creating uh, robust service networks and service continuity, particularly for the unemployed population. So I'm gonna run through what we observed in New Jersey, but in the chat, I would love to um, see comments about your experiences in your respective states and in your respective libraries. Um, okay, so overall, like I said, we did observe significant adaptations to operate in a virtual environment. New Jersey public libraries um, really further established themselves as um, community entities providing an extensive amount of services for children, families, and teens. Adult programming was also present and was often geared towards wellness and recreational activities. And we heard um, from librarians directly that they actually found uh, adult programming was a little bit harder to adjust to a virtual environment. Um, two particular reasons came up, uh, the first one being uh, librarians reported having difficulties transitioning the classroom structure into a virtual environment. And the second was that they found that adult programming often had the lowest turnout. So even when adult programming may have been started due to constraints of resources and time, sometimes it was um, stopped. So those are the two challenges that we saw in terms of adult programming. Uh, job seeker specific programming was overall sparse. In our uh, review of the websites, approximately 31% of websites indicated that they had some specific content resources or programming dedicated to job seekers. So again, the poll from before, you all said you were um, pretty active in the workforce services space. So I would love to um, see comments about the programs you all are running in your libraries and states. Um, so overall, uh, we saw in our review of New Jersey public libraries that there was a little sharing of assets across libraries. We saw very innovative programming pipe, uh, popping up at hyper-localized levels. And sometimes that programming was not shared 
even within smaller geographic re regions within the county and within the state overall, um, it was very hyper-localized. Um, there was also observed a disparity of resources, programming, and protocols between libraries. And this was because uh, librarians reported that uh, they were making decisions for their specific facility, their specific staff, and that led to some customer confusion. And an issue that was particularly confusing that kept coming up was whether libraries were open or closed during the course of the pandemic. So that leads me to my last point, that the communication of services to the public could at some times be unclear, particularly around this issue of open or closed status, and also what it means to be open or closed virtually and physically. So that was um, definitely a source of confusion that many librarians reported in our work. And overall, this has led us to um, really uh, harp on the fact that, you know, in this new environment, websites are another front door, if you will, and there could be a case for more attention and efforts to be paid to creating uh, welcoming and seamless experiences virtually, which would be comparable to the experience that someone would have walking into a library in person. Um, and, and yeah, so that is the overall um, summary of our work in New Jersey specifically. Uh, next slide, please. So it is important to acknowledge the complexity of the times and from our work, the uh, sheer exacerbated scope of needs uh, service providers are having to field at this time. From our work with the librarians in New Jersey, we very much understand that librarians are in touch with community issues in a deep way. Librarians are reporting, uh, dealing with issues of broadband access, internet access, um, sorry, uh, device access, uh, food insecurity, housing insecurity, computer literacy, um, issues with submitting job applications online, difficulties in submitting forms and collecting benefits. So by their nature, librarians wear a lot of hats and often fill gaps in services, um, particularly in times of economic difficulties and hardships. But the sheer extent of the needs and complexity of the needs at this particular moment of time may necessitate a broader rethinking of services and service delivery. Next slide. So that brings us to um, communities of care. Uh, communities of care are a new way of approaching workforce development services. Communities of care uh, take into the account the needs of the whole person, which brings in more supports for the social and emotional components of job search. Uh, we find that libraries are a natural model of communities of care um, as is. Uh, libraries often serve as community hubs, community resource aggregators, and like I said, bridge the divide for public assistance services um, oftentimes. Um, but, you know, in and why this is important to provide social and emotional supports um, in the workforce development field at this time. So the graph on um, the slide is data from the uh, U US Census Bureau's Household Pulse Survey, uh, which asks um, adults um, if they've experienced symptoms of anxiety or depression in the last seven days. So data from November 2020, when we were looking deeply um, at the study, showed that at that time, 41.4% of adults were experiencing symptoms of anxiety or depression, um, which can be contrasted which is similar, uh, with a similar survey from 2019 by the National Center for Health Statistics, which at th that time was painting a picture that about 11% of adults were experiencing symptoms of anxiety or depression. So again, the needs are exacerbated and different. So it could be uh, a good time to consider how instating communities, communities of care and community, 
communities of care practices um, could be a worthwhile endeavor. Uh, next slide. So as I said, libraries are uh, naturally occurring communities of care based on the work that you do, but how to operationalize virtual communities of care um, is, uh, could, could be a next step. Um, this can take on many forms, but a few I just want to highlight. So integrating trauma-informed care practices and service delivery and creating opportunities for social connection could um, remind job seekers that they are not alone in their search and that they're, they um, have supports within their communities that can deal with of the variety of needs that they are presenting at this time. Additionally, fostering community diversity and inclusivity is a, another reminder of the supportive networks that can be created um, for people um, who you know, may have different backgrounds, experiences, come from different industries, but can all support each other in their search and move each other forward in their search as well. Next slide. And in practice, um, operationalizing virtual communities of care can again take many forms, but a few to consider are hosting group career coaching sessions. Um, that has been a structure that's been very um, effective for some of the programs the Heldrick Center directly runs. Um, this is in, this can be empowering for job seekers to um, help one another in their searches, as well as creating group motivation and group accountability structures. Um, curating information, um, you know, there is a plethora of job search information out there. Um, and oftentimes people don't know where to start or how to start. So often curating um, information can be helpful in narrowing job seekers' attention um, into more actionable steps. And again, propelling them into taking action is um, sometimes more likely when the information that they re received is um, smaller, digestible, and curated. And lastly, just calling out the uh, to expand services to address social and emotional components of job search. Uh, this can take a variety of forms, whether it is um, engaging third party services or bringing in expert presenters. But, you know, in the times that we are in and with the variety of needs that many libraries are experiencing at this time, it could be um, something to consider and all in service to operationalize a virtual community of care. Next slide. Uh, so these are the lessons that we have learned from our work with the public libraries in New Jersey and how to uh, strategically um, go about operationalizing communities of care. If anyone has any questions, um, please feel free to reach out. Thank you. Hi, thank you all so much. Um, we are fortunate to have Amanda, Stephanie, and Leanna as allies in our work, listening to libraries work and sharing their expertise with library and workforce staff, as well as state and federal policymakers. I also hope to connect some dots with your work in my co next comments. First, you all probably know this, but I'd like to briefly introduce myself in the ALA and Public Library Association. The ALA mission of promoting library services and sharing best practices is the foundation of our advocacy at the national level, as well as our continuing education and overall member services. I have the unique pleasure of splitting my time between ALA's Public Policy and Advocacy Office and PLA, serving as a deputy director in both areas. I've worked at the ALA for just over 20 years in a variety of capacities, but digital inclusion and how library technology services support upskilling and lifelong learning have been threads throughout my media relations, research policy, and strategic initiatives work. Every day, I appreciate the opportunity to work with and for ALA members in the field, and I'm really glad to see all of you and to see all the information you're sharing in the chat, so thank you for that. Um, I'm going to spend a few minutes talking about framing and policy advocacy, the spectrum of workforce services, because I've seen a few notes about that in the chat, and then a call to action and some resources along with what we've seen from uh, the Heldrick Center and also um, the Skills Coalition. 
So this is the intersection that has excited me for most of my time working with libraries, which is connecting what libraries do relative to what communities need and in context for what policymakers prioritize. To make it easier for key stakeholders to see and remember the diverse work of libraries, we have coined the term the ease of libraries, which includes employment, education, and equity, among others. This concept is central to how the ALA Public Policy and Advocacy Office advocates at the federal and state levels. Next slide. In the wake of the Great Recession, for instance, we talked about the significant expansion of library services related to helping job seekers gain digital skills and get back to work as part of our advocacy for including libraries as eligible entities for WIOA funding. We saw that libraries had deepened their services in this area because of overwhelming needs, which also made employment a focus for legislators. Similarly, ALA demonstrated the challenges and innovations of public libraries in bridging persistent digital divides as part of our advocacy for last year's CARES Act funding and the most recent American Rescue Plan Act, which includes $200 million for the Institute of Museum and Library Services, the largest single increase in the agency's 25 year history. And it's also part of our current work to advance the Build America's Libraries Act, which would bring $5 billion in federal capital funding for libraries in every state. In a nutshell, next slide, don't tell them what you want to say, tell them what they need to know. So what do policymakers and potential partners need to know? And you've heard this throughout the day, um, and hopefully this is all in your own as you, as you talk with your, um, your local and city and county officials. From my research and conversations with libraries and workforce staff, policymakers and our potential partners and funders need to understand our reach, our expertise in diverse resources and our track record of collaboration and trust. For example, there are 2,400 American job centers in the United States, but there are nearly 17,000 public library locations alone, not including our K-12 and academic library colleagues. In pre-pandemic times, public libraries hosted 1.3 billion visits every year. Libraries can extend the reach of workforce services. Our staff, technology, and collections provide relevant resources for people of all ages and stages, including the pursuit of industry credentials most recently. And as Amanda said, library staff have long been leaders in digital skills building. And we're trusted institutions that connect people and resources every day. I'm not going to read through these two slides. Um, they reflect much of what I'm seeing in the chat, particularly and what we've heard from our previous speakers. But I wanted to reference examples in case your library offers these programs or resources but doesn't think of them in a workforce context. Two examples of this are public access technology and adult education and literacy. Neither of these are strictly limited to workforce purposes, but this digital access and basic skills development are vital for advancing employment opportunities. Next slide. Or it may be that you're considering what additional services you might offer. There is so much great work happening in the field, and I hope to host more programs this year featuring library staff and their workforce partners sharing their best practices and tools ranging from memos of understanding and scopes of work to virtual reality career exploration. So many of you that are here are doing this work, and I look forward to bringing us together in different ways in the future. And you can find more examples in details in the links that are at the end of my section. So the next piece I wanted to talk about is um, a working draft of a spectrum of library workforce services in collaboration that I found in my research. I believe all libraries are serving learners, job seekers, and career changers with no fee, public access to technology, and referrals to workforce agencies. So those of you that in the 12% that said, no, you don't offer workforce services, I believe you probably are, but you may not think about it in those terms. Many libraries, likely a majority of libraries, offer workforce related programming and specialized resources such as the ones we've seen in the chat, like career online high school or test preparation and brain fuse. And they also connect as needed with workforce partners often hosting them in their spaces. And finally, some libraries have ongoing partnerships that may include asset mapping to differentiate and even co develop services in their communities. They offer regular consistent programs and training and they have dedicated staff for coordinating this I hope that mapping the spectrum of engagement 
policymakers see what is possible through libraries. Libraries have a range of capacities, of course, but these contributions should be recognized, supported, and leveraged to advance economic recovery and resilience, which is why we're all here today. So next slide. As my library colleagues will attest, federal WIOA funds carry with them specific priorities and eligibility. Unlike workforce agencies, libraries serve everyone in a community. Libraries may apply for WIOA funding, which comes with related requirements for those participants, but all libraries offer job-related services available to all, as Pikes Peak Library District staff articulate here. And the next slide is what their partners have said. Increasing awareness of library workforce related services with your local workforce board and agency staff strengthens the network of support for workers, as the Pikes Peak partners share here. To quickly recap what we've all been talking about in this time, because it helps to hear it once, hear it twice, technology access and digital literacy programs are workforce services. The 2010 Opportunity for All report funded by IMLS found that 40% of library computer users received help with career needs, including online job search and applications. And Pennsylvania's Department of Labor and Industry for One recently closed the application window to apply for $4.5 million in digital literacy and workforce development grants to enhance foundational digital literacy skills for job seekers and increase access to employment opportunities. Our communities of color and low, com, low income residents in particular need libraries to engage and promote our workforce services. But we're not alone in this work and we can strengthen our network so we don't have to carry this load alone. Library staff know how to do this work, as we've seen with census complete count advocacy and helping people get health insurance and human services support. And now is the time. Economic recovery is top of mind for our local, state, and national elected leaders, and libraries need to be part of this conversation. So here are some action items I hope you will consider in weeks and months as American Rescue Plan funds become available if you haven't already done so. Review your programs and services and how you can package them together to make them easier to share and find. Many times libraries are promoting the newest, greatest piece of that they've added to their um, workforce services, but don't necessarily share the entire scope of that work with their partners. Talk with your local partners about your strengths and also the gaps and where you might do some work together to fill those gaps. I hope you'll be promoting your child widely as um, as we heard from the Heldrick folks um, communications and folks awareness of our resources continues to lag all of the work that you're doing. Um, a national fact tank, New America, recently released research this month about the public's awareness and use of libraries online resources during the pandemic. While 68% of survey respondents said they were aware of a public library in their area offering online resources, higher income households were more likely to be familiar with your services. Too many people, including public and nonprofit agencies, do not know the range of resources libraries offer, which hurts our ability to reach and serve the people who need us most. Hope you'll assess, refine, and consider how you might expand your services and share your successes with folks at all levels of government and also with advocates like at your state and national level with ALA. Finally, here are some resources I hope will support your planning, outreach, and advocacy, in addition to the reports from the Heldrick Center and the National Skills Coalition. In particular, I'd like to give a big shout out to the Libs Work Network of state and public library staff around the country meeting monthly and sharing information and resources related to improving library workforce services. I know many of them are here and it's come up several times in our conversation today. And I've learned a lot with this group and I would recommend them to to any of you who'd like to continue building knowledge and partnership in, in this space. I welcome your questions and collaboration as we continue this work. And I'm gonna pass the baton to Jessica. Thank you. Thanks, Laura. Um, so I'm gonna sort of just hit home a lot of the things that Laura just spoke about, um, speaking more uh, generally in terms of advocacy and what that might look like for you. Um, and so as the slide says, now is the time to advocate. I mean, we're in a really important moment right now. We're so lucky to be here with you today. Um, so when we think about all of the data and research that my colleagues have just gone into about the critical role that libraries play in connecting your community to workforce services, um, I want you to also think about 
the work that you do. Um, I expect a lot of this information landed with some head nods in terms of what you're seeing back home and maybe some puzzled faces because the data doesn't match your experience on the ground. Um, if you take anything from today's webinar in terms of advocacy, is that in order for change to happen, the information needs to go both ways. Um, policymakers are just as interested in compelling storytelling from their constituents as regular people are, and that's you. Um, your expertise and what you're seeing on the ground in a very person-to-person -person human way is what we cannot offer. Um, the fact that you're a constituent, that you can speak to the community is something that we cannot offer. And so I can't press enough how important your expertise on the ground is in terms of informing policy. Um, and as Amanda mentioned earlier, you're not expected to be policy experts. Um, you're already experts in the needs of your branch and in the needs of your community. Um, so the first way to influence policy, for instance, is at the local level. Um, and, and to influence um, the sort of resources that you receive as a library in terms of accessing workforce. Um, if you already don't, if you're not, don't have a relationship already with your workforce board, this is a great opportunity to do that. The squeaky wheel gets the grease. Um, a large portion of the funding for workforce development um, from the federal and state level goes through your local board. So they need to know what you offer and how to best leverage your resources in order to include you in their plans. Um, so that can be as simple as a sort of Google um, about, about who your local board is um, and, and what that conversation might look like. Um, if you can go to the next slide, Jimmy, at the state level, um, you would just need to connect the dots for your governor's office about libraries and the new ARP funds. So again, in terms of connecting the dots, in terms of you not needing to be a, a policy expert, um, you already have a job, right? You, we are your resource for having these conversations. So um, the main thing I want you to take away is to not be intimidated by these conversations, because like I said, your perspective and expertise is something that no one else can offer. Um, you know, everyone that spoke on this call today is a resource for talking points, for the wealth of data that you already received, um, for me in particular, to plug you into opportunities to make an impact at the federal level. All right, so if we go to the federal level. Um, so something that's happening right now that, um, you know, everyone else that spoke before me has alluded to is um, to tell your congressperson that new infrastructure spending must include investments in workforce development. So tomorrow, President Biden is actually going to release his Build Back Better plan, um, and that's going to include a lot of ambitious investments in rebuilding our crumbling infrastructure and support our economy. Um, after the president lays out his plan, Congress will be going back and forth and looking to their constituents to make informed decisions about who needs what. We've seen this happen over the last few years. Um, I believe Amanda mentioned that libraries are really involved in the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act um, back in the recession of 2008. A lot of us have been there. We've already done this. And so this is a, a new opportunity to, to share your expertise about what worked last time, what's needed in order to really rebuild in a way that's able to include everyone. And again, I mean, we cannot hit home enough that libraries are a trusted undermarketed resource for workforce development services, as you already know. And so it's just a matter of communicating that to people that can make those decisions. Um, to circle back to National Skills Coalition really quick, um, we're a coalition of people that spend our days serving our communities and thinking about how to connect people to good jobs. Um, historically, this has included community and technical colleges, community-based organizations, business, labor, and our libraries. Um, we would love more libraries to be brought into the fold of the advocacy that we do. Um, as we develop our agendas, we look to our coalition at every step. Is this right? What do we need to change in order for this to actually reflect the best practices that you're seeing on the ground? Once we develop policies that make sense, then we mobilize the same people that helped us to develop those policies to connect with our policymakers and advocate for them and then make change at the federal state level. Um, so I saw at the beginning that nearly 50% of the folks on this call said that they offer workforce services. So I really invite you to stay in touch with us. I wanna know what you're seeing and what we can do to elevate your work. In the immediate future, um, the first opportunity to, to, to do advocacy on this is to make your voice heard during this infrastructure conversation on Capitol Hill. Um, so we have a webinar on April 20th where we'll be talking about our infrastructure asks that work to ensure that we build back better with everyone. Um, so we'll also send out an action page where you can sign on to say that an infrastructure bill needs to include investments in workforce. Um, we can't throw a bunch of money at new jobs without creating opportunities for people to get the skills needed to fill those jobs in their community. Um, that's essentially what we're saying. And, and I think that libraries are really 
um, good person to reinforce that. Um, so after that, I'd like to meet some of you virtually, learn about what we're missing in our advocacy. Based on where you live, I'd also like to reach out to invite you to share your expertise and stories of your patrons to educate your members. Um, so don't hesitate to reach out with any questions or ideas. Um, we are so happy that Laura helped us connect the dots for us about the role that libraries play. And I hope to continue to build our partnerships with you all um, and make sure that you have a seat at the table. Because again, as we've said over and over again, I mean, you really are at the nexus of services for a lot of people and you're a trusted resource and we want you uh, along for the ride um, with this new administration and this new Congress. So thank you so much and look forward to connecting soon. Thank you all. I don't know, yeah, I, everybody's got their, their video back on. I have captured, I'm gonna mention one question that I saw in the chat for um, folks at Heldrick. Um, Marie asks about um, the virtual coaching or workshops offered by one-stop centers. You all talked about libraries making that strategic pivot, but can you talk a little bit about um, the, the pivot that workforce agencies in New Jersey, for instance, might be making? And, and Amanda or Jessica, you may also have something to offer, but I know that the Heldrick folks have looked at workforce centers as well as libraries. Sure, um, I can speak to that. So um, it is our understanding that a lot of workforce um, agencies are still using the one on one model um, and doing that to um, support their coach career coaching relationships. While that is effect effective and has worked, um, it is also very time intensive. And we are suggesting that in this age of technological supports, that it could be um, a worthwhile endeavor to entertain more group coaching models because we have found in the programs that we run at the Heldrick Center, namely the New Jersey Career Network Job Seeker Community, as well as the New Start Career Network Program, that group coaching models can also be very effective in, again, reminding people that they are not alone in their search and that they, they are empowered to help each other. Um, so it's a sort of a doubly beneficial um, structure. I think a lot of workforce um, agencies are also um, still in the process of figuring out how to do um, group orientations and group um, meetings in that way. So um, I can't speak to that as much, but I think for coaching, it's still a one-on-one -on -one model. Thanks a lot. Um, there's another question about um, up and coming careers and jobs that don't need a four year college degree. And I don't know, Amanda, if you wanna take this, I think it's been really interesting to think about public libraries as it relates to um, some of the credential opportunities that might be available as well as that pipeline to formal education and apprenticeship. Yeah, so because I have a group of libraries on today's webinar, I am not gonna feel shy about saying, <laughs> guess what? There's a wealth of data out there. So one thing to be aware of is every state has a labor market information agency, an LMI agency. That agency is responsible for developing lists of high priority occupations and other in-demand careers. Many of these are referred to as middle skills jobs, that is jobs that require more than a high school diploma, but not a four-year degree. And this can often be really powerful information at the local and regional level, right? Because what's true in Philadelphia might not be true in rural Mississippi, right? Um, so it's always valuable to turn to your state and local partners whose job it is to analyze labor market data and ask them about what they're seeing in the data and what is, is powerful. The other piece of the puzzle is there's a fabulous website called Credential Engine, which I'll link to in the chat. Credential Engine is a nonprofit that has mapped over 900,000 post-secondary credentials. That is two-year degrees, four-year degrees, certificates, certifications. And that can be a good double check for you, for your patrons to try to figure out, hey, is this a credential that employers actually care about? Does this credential have any third party verification? Does this credential map to a state occupational license? And it can really help you do kind of the sniff test for what might seem like a popular occupation or industry to figure out like, is this something where there's some legitimate demand for it? I'll also flag that there's a couple of organizations doing some really interesting work on skills-based or competency-based hiring. 
And that includes both opportunity at work they have a program focusing on what they call STARS, people who are skilled through alternative routes. So maybe young people who aged out of the foster care system or people returning from incarceration who might not have a traditional educational credential, but do have expertise that they would like to be able to have an employer recognize and to be able to apply in the job market. Another resource on that front is a nonprofit called Skillful which is also doing a lot of work on competency-based or skill-based hiring. And then finally, just sort of hopscotching back for a second uh, to the question about local workforce centers, we see that there's enormous une unevenness across the country. Some workforce boards and career centers were providing a lot of services virtually even before the pandemic and were able to pivot pretty quickly, and many really struggled to pivot. And actually, we also see that adult education providers, that is the WIOA Title II partners, were able to pivot more easily. Um, so if you aren't already plugged into your adult education partners in your community, they could be a great partner in thinking through what do virtual career services look like in this moment. Thanks a lot. Um, I there's a There's been a few other questions um, that I, I'm not sure if I caught them. I don't know, Amanda, if there was anything that you saw come in, um, because I know one question um, is that that we had was what type of data do libraries collect on their career services? But I don't know if Heldrick folks know the answer as to what data is available that libraries are collecting, um, but maybe you all could talk about that. And then I will turn it over to you, Amanda, for any questions you might have seen. And then also, I know we're getting close to time. Yeah, I can take that one. We did a project for a US Department of Labor contract a few years ago. So things might have changed since then. Um, at the time we pinpointed a few leaders who were collecting data. And of course it was, um, while data is important to you know tell the story in the context of the services you're providing, it was kind of difficult in the library context because of this openness and welcomeness that people expect when they come in, not necessarily like somewhere else where you come in and have to put down your phone and you know social security number and stuff. So what we saw people were collecting was either kind of visits, number of visits, number of people signing up for services, um, website logins, webinar usage, those types of things. Other things were sur um, surveys going out to their patrons, either before and after services received to see kind of satisfaction um, and then, you know, the most sophisticated that we saw were follow-ups, and these were usually grant-funded programs within the libraries, um, where they had the resources and capacity to follow up with people after programming to see, did you get a job? Did you attain that credential or skill um, to be able to report that out long-term? That's great. Um, and Lara, I'll, I'll take you up on your offer here to chime in on one more, um, which is, uh, I saw Maria's question in the chat about a large and diverse patron base and potentially low participation. Two really innovative outreach strategies I've seen. The first is a low budget program in New Mexico that was trying to reach low income parents who were about to lose their childcare subsidy. And they bought a couple of very cheap Facebook ads that were geotagged for people who were sitting in the waiting room for their local uh, Department of Human Services office. So the thought was parents will be sitting in the waiting room waiting to speak to their caseworker. They'll be on their phones, they'll be checking Facebook and they will see this outreach ad for us to connect with them about childcare. And that worked remarkably well. The second is a really creative, um, uh, strategy that I used a couple of years ago with a project I did at my previous organization um, in which we used uh, a program that uses free conference call services to broadcast immigrant radio stations. Um, and we reached 4,000 people in 72 hours. Um, and so I wrote up a little case study about it, which I'm putting into the chat right now. Uh, if folks want to dig into that. But oftentimes when you're thinking about reaching patrons in your community who might not be reachable through traditional forms, these, these are two pretty creative ways to get in touch with folks. Uh, we're at time here, so I'm going to turn it back to Lara because she's been our partner in planning and designing this webinar. We are so pleased to be working with ALA and PLA 
so appreciative that the Heldridge Center folks were able to join us. Lara, you want to close us out? Sure. I wasn't sure, Amanda, if we, if there, oh, is this, the, uh, is this going to pop up or did you have more slides? I thought I remembered that you had a couple more at the end. Sorry. Oh, thank you. Yes, there are a couple of resource slides, but I'm not going to walk through them. Okay. Folks will just have those to, to reference after the webinar. Awesome. So am I asking these questions or will there be a pop-up? There'll be a pop-up. Folks oh, will get very to see the evaluation. Yeah. <laughs> right. Sorry about Super. that. No problem. I, I was just like, how did we decide this? Um, so I'm just going to say thank you to all of you um, for being here and to our amazing partners at the National Skills Coalition and the Heldrick Center. Um, it's really been my pleasure to meet and talk with them as well as with the Libs Work folks. Um, and we will follow up um, and share more resources and invite you to come together again um, with us, with the American Library Association and PLA. Um, thank you for your work. And we hope that you will tell everybody about it because um, that is how we can increase awareness among our patrons, among our policymakers. So thank you so much.